Well, good evening and welcome to Dome at Home. My name is Scott Young. I'll be your host for this evening. I'm the Planetarium Astronomer at the Manitoba Museum. And we have a good show lined up for you tonight. So we're going to be taking a look at the closest star to the Earth. We're going to be looking at the planets that are becoming visible in the evening sky. Talk about all the UFOs that have been visible over uh, Manitoba the last couple of days or so. And we'll get to some of your questions as well, as well as cool space stuff and the constellations and all that kind of stuff. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's uh, great to see you. It's nice to see so many um familiar names popping up in the chat here really great um to see how many people are here we're live on zoom facebook live and youtube live with me as always is mike he'll be moderating our chats parsing all the questions and uh keeping keeping track of things online there how you doing mike not too bad scott i uh, hope our audience is feeling good as well it's good to see a lot of familiar names uh, as well in our uh, our participant list here. It's great. Yeah, absolutely. And on Facebook and YouTube too. That's right. Yeah. It's, uh, and I think we got Facebook and YouTube sorted out after a little bit of a kerfuffle last week. That's the scientific term kerfuffle. Um, but, uh, everything seems to be working now. I hope that the various folks can, uh, be accessing the appropriate stream. All right. Um, it's a beautiful, day outside uh it was kind of hard to drag ourselves in as mike was was saying uh to me before the show it's hard to come in to the basement with no windows to do these shows when it's so nice outside i think we should just move all these shows outside and uh just stay out because it's really not dark when we're doing these shows anyway anymore so we might as well just be outside maybe we'll look at that um but today we are going to be talking about the sun oh um i just saw landon uh mentioned in the chat here uh, international astronomy day yes international astronomy day comes is coming up this saturday and we're talking about our online event that we will be hosting for international astronomy day it's also manitoba week this week manitoba day was may the 12th and the museums had a whole bunch of programs all week running right up until saturday so we'll talk about that towards the end of the show thanks for reminding me to uh to mention it okay uh let's see we've got Nice sunny weather. The weather is uh, finally turning into something that is nice to spend time out. And uh, that's why we're talking about the sun. The sun is the source of all of our heat and light. The sun is the nearest star to us. It pretty much has the biggest influence on our planet and all the other planets in the solar system. It's also really bright. So you can't just go outside and stare at it without damaging your eyes. So we're going to show you how to view the sun safely. We're going to show you how to um, observe the sun and see what's going on as the solar activity builds. We're also going to uh, get to some of our questions. We've been receiving a lot of mail. Um, Oakenwald School sent us this huge package of material uh, with a whole bunch of uh, great artwork and, uh, and things like that, as well as a bunch of questions. And during Q&A today, we will be uh, answering a few of those questions. And we'll be doing that every week this week or uh, uh, this month to try and get through some of those questions. If you have questions, you can always ask them in the chat there, drop them in and Mike will try and get them, uh, get them to me. And if you don't uh, want to ask a question, you know, in a more public forum, you can always drop us an email and we'll, we'll get to it later on. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, we also got some mail. Uh, Ulrich uh, has been doing a lot of observing with uh, his binoculars. And we've actually, we've had a number of people asking about binoculars and how to observe the sky. As, as uh, I've mentioned before, telescopes are hard to come by right now. In fact, I was talking to my telescope distributor today and he basically said there are no telescopes available pretty much anywhere in the world right now. There's just such a huge shortage partly because of all the factory delays from COVID and also because so many people are taking it up as a hobby as you're stuck at home for various periods of time. As, uh, as many of you know, astronomy is a great hobby. So binoculars are becoming the instrument of choice again. We'll be talking about something you can see in your binoculars later in the show as well. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, we, uh, along those lines, we'll be running a special uh, virtual course through the museum, which is called Stargazing with Binoculars. That's on June the 13th, and then we'll run it again as a repeat on uh, June the 15th. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up for that course through the Manitoba Museum's website uh, under Programs and Events. 
And speaking of programs and events, uh, as Landon pointed out, Saturday is International Astronomy Day. And that is the day that astronomers all around the world basically bring out their telescopes and show the public the stars. Bringing astronomy to the public is sort of the mandate of International Astronomy Day. Every year, um, the planetarium and the local astronomy club and the universities and all sorts of folks have sort of gotten together or done their own events where they've just shown people the stars. Of course, unfortunately, this year, we're not uh, in a position to do that. This is a shot that, that came up in my Facebook memories from uh, just a week or so ago we, when we used to gather people together and actually look through telescopes. We'll get there again. We will. But uh, not by Saturday, unfortunately. So Saturday, we are hosting a uh, live telescope viewing event. Saturday, May the 15th. Uh, the, the show starts at 7 o'clock. That's before it gets dark, but the moon will be up. So we'll start looking at the moon at 7 o'clock. We'll take a little break around 7.45 and then come back at 9 o'clock when it's gotten a bit darker and we'll be able to see um, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. We'll take a look at those through the telescopes. We'll talk binoculars. We'll answer questions and uh, get some more views of the moon as well. So join us for that. That'll be through the museum's Facebook page and the museum's um, YouTube uh, account as well. And that way you can uh, view it. Uh, on either of those. You don't need an account at YouTube, so you can just uh, find uh, youtube.com slash Manitoba Museum, and that's where the event will be for that. All right, let's take a look at the sky. So it gets late, it gets dark quite late. The sun sets, you know, at, you know after eight o'clock, it's, it's getting darker, maybe, you know, quarter to nine, it, stars are starting to come out, but it's still a fairly bright sky. This is the sky at nine o'clock, and there's still that, um, that glow, that twilight color along the western horizon where the sun has just gone down. By nine o'clock, though, you're pretty much past the point where you can see two of the planets, Mercury and Venus. You really have to catch them right now quite early, just as soon as it starts getting dark. And so to, to uh, take a look at that, rather than playing, playing around with the uh, Stellarium view, what I've done is I've made a few stills here, and we can take a look at what the sky will look like. This is the sky tonight around 945, looking a little bit north of west, basically straight west. Down in the trees over here, is a brilliant star, which is the planet Venus, but it's so low that unless you have a really, unless you're like on the ocean or something, or you have a perfectly flat Western horizon, you're probably not gonna see it. It's very, very close to the sun still, but rising up higher is the planet Mercury. And Mercury is quite bright. And right next to it is a very, very thin crescent moon. Now, some of you might've seen yesterday, there were pictures of the moon right next to Venus. And uh, that marked the, uh, the end of Ramadan, actually. The, the sighting of the, of the first crescent moon um, marked the end of that holiday for our Muslim friends. So, uh, Eid Mubarak. And um, the, uh, the moon, of course, has moved on already. And now we're a full day away. The moon is up by Mercury. So this is the sky tonight. If it stays clear, get out there as soon as the sun goes down. If you have binoculars, use those because they will help you pull things out of the out of the bright sky. If you miss it tonight, not a big deal. The moon will move on, but those planets are still there. Here's the, the binocular view tonight, though. You can get the really, really thin crescent moon. You just see a little fingernail clipping lit up on that side. And then the planet Mercury just appearing as a, a nice bright star in the twilight. Mercury is a hard planet to find. This week, and into next week is pretty much your best chance all year to see it. So this is a good time to go out and try and spot the, the innermost planet. So here we have um, the sky here. Tomorrow night, the moon will have moved on on Friday. So it's about halfway between Mercury here and much, much fainter Mars. We've been talking about Mars since this show started in January. And it's still hanging on in the Western horizon, but it's gotten very, very faint and um, still there though. So this is the sky Friday night. Saturday night, the moon will be right next to Mars, a nice view for our telescope night uh, on International Astronomy Day. 
And so we'll get a good view of the crescent moon uh, sitting right next to Mars. And then as the week goes on, that object will go a little higher into the sky as well. Now there's one other object in this part of the sky at, at sunset that you might see. In fact, it's brighter than all the other ones. It's this star up here. This star is called Capella. It's in the constellation of Auriga, the charioteer. We've talked about Capella before. Capella is um, the, uh, the uh, brightest star in Auriga, which is a charioteer that doesn't have a chariot, but in, instead is carrying goats. You may remember that from our Connect the Dots feature on Auriga a few weeks back. Anyway, that star is, is up there, and it's probably the first thing that you'll spot if the sky is nice and clear. But soon afterwards, much lower, you'll be able to spot Mercury. All these images are on the Manitoba Museum's webpage uh, under the uh, current night sky section in the planetarium. So you can actually see these uh, and use them for reference if you want to go out and check out your uh, the, uh, the sky there. Let's see. Now Venus is actually visible if you have a nice clear horizon. Here I basically changed the image just to get rid of all those trees. So if you do have a nice western horizon, you can get out there and try to spot Venus right after sunset. Normally you wouldn't see anything that close to the sun, but Venus is the brightest planet of all. So that makes it nice and easy to spot, relatively speaking. But you only have 15, 20 minutes or so before it will set below the horizon. Because of course, everything is setting over there in the West, the sun sets and all the stars will slowly follow it. So that will continue, uh, that pattern continues in the, in the course of the evening. By about 9.30, Venus and Mercury are already out of sight. So it takes a little bit of precise timing to be able to catch these things. As far as the rest of the sky goes, the Western sky, those winter constellations are really pretty much disappearing. Even our springtime constellations, they're no longer, you know, um, only in the South, they've already moved pretty far across the sky. Here's Leo the lion over here, the bright star Regulus. And then this is Leo's head with these stars. This is the body. And then he's got a tail over there. Leo is already past the Southern um, Meridian and is over to the Southwest. Virgo is starting to rise a little bit higher, next Zodiac constellation with the bright star Spica. And then again, the fainter constellations much not a whole lot to see down here. They're, they're quite difficult to trace, especially inside the city. Many of this, the bright stars of these constellations like Hydra and Sextons and Crater and Corvus the Crow, they're just hard to find from inside the city. Over in the east, we still have um, our friend Arcturus, this really bright star, pretty much the brightest star you can see in, this, uh, in the sky right now. Um, it's part of Boate's The Herdsman. And if you recall, we, we find Arcturus by first finding the Big Dipper, which is still right up overhead. Oh, I got to pull it down a bit more so you can see it. There we go. The Big Dipper right up overhead. And then uh, the curved handle or the arc of the handle arcs to Arcturus. And that helps you find that nice bright star. Below Arcturus, we're hitting summer. These are all summer constellations. Hercules, we've talked about a bit. Vega, the bright star in Lyra the Harp. And down here, some of these um, fainter ones like Ophiuchus, the serpent carrier, and then Serpens, the serpent that he is carrying, and Libra, the scales over here. All of those are constellations that herald the rising of the summer constellations in the Milky Way. When we start to see those, we know that the Milky Way is only a couple of hours behind in terms of rising up. If you stay up all night, you'll start to see the Milky Way rising already. But if you don't want to stay up too late, that'll be uh, that'll be a summertime thing for you. Let's see. Off in the north, like I say, the Big Dipper is high up over our, our heads. But another constellation that we've talked about a lot in the north is Cassiopeia the Queen. Uh, she looks quite uncomfortable at this time of the year, simply because she's pictured upside down. Here's the W shape of Cassiopeia. She's supposed to be um, a queen on her throne, but it's much easier to see the W shape. Um, Cassiopeia has been in the news recently because there is a new star in Cassiopeia. That's not the kind of thing that happens terribly often, 
but uh, a new star or a nova as it's called has erupted in the constellation of Cassiopeia. This actually happened a few months back, but it wasn't bright enough to be seen by the average person. I mean, folks with telescopes could actually um, could actually see it, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Well, it suddenly brightened unexpectedly just this week. And so now it has become more visible. So this is our binocular challenge object for, oops, for this week. Here's a sort of a more detailed map. There's good old Cassiopeia. And it the shape of the W, one side looks like a nice reasonable W. And then the other side, it looks like somebody sat on it or bent it out of shape or whatever. Well, you start on the, on the nice side of the W, sort of the right-hand side. These two stars basically go in a line about the same distance and you come to a tiny little thing called M52. That's a nice little star cluster. Binoculars will show that, or a really, really dark sky, you'll see a little slightly fuzzy thing, but really that's a binocular kind of object. So it's worth the trip just to see that. If we zoom in, or right underneath that is where the new star is. Now notice, it does not jump out at you. This is not the kind of thing you're just gonna be able to go and point your binoculars and see something amazing. This is more sort of a curiosity of tracking down something that is fairly uncommon, a new star that's appeared to the, to the unaided eye. If we zoom in a little bit more, here's the area that we're looking at over here. There's M52, the tiny little star cluster, and just below it is the star, the nova. Again, it does not stand out at all. If you look at, if you're looking in binoculars, oh, and that's a little bit, uh, that's a little bit dim, it looks like, but, uh, Basically, there's these three stars in kind of a broken or a, a bent line. And the middle one is the star that is the nova. Now that star right now is that brightness, but it will eventually slowly fade away. And after a few weeks, we won't be able to see it anymore. For the people that are really interested in this, it turns out that these objects are often either discovered by or uh, observed by amateur astronomers, just people like you and me in our backyards, not, you know, scientists in observatories or space telescopes or things like that. It's just the average person because all you need is a pair of binoculars to see it. And so there's a, there's a whole group devoted to this. It's called the, uh, the AAVSO, the American Association of Variable Star Observers. And they basically have a whole bunch of resources where you can actually learn to look at these stars that change in their brightness. They're called variable stars. And you can, um, using a comparison chart, figure out how bright it is compared to other stars. And then you can send those things in, the, that information in. And with that, they build up a, a, a curve of what the star's behavior is like from people all around the world. Basically, citizen science. Um, and the, the AAVSO has been around for more than 100 years doing this kind of thing. Now there's all sorts of electronic versions of, of ways to do this, but the visual observer with a pair of binoculars can still contribute real science. So if you've got binoculars and you're interested in this, uh, visit aavso.org and they have a beginner's package there telling you what you need to do and how you can estimate the brightness of the stars just use your binoculars. Uh, Susan has asked, does the star have a name? Yeah, it has the official name of V1405 Cassiopeia. And that basically means it's the 1405th variable star discovered in the constellation of Cassiopeia. We've given up on giving things um, poetic names or things like that pretty much unless something's really, really special, it just gets a catalog number nowadays. There's just too much out there. All right, uh, Mike has dropped the link for AAVSO in the uh, chat there. And so you can always check that out. All right, let's see what we have next on our section here. We have our feature, which is the sun. Okay, I will begin this with the warning that I always provide. The sun is a mass of incandescent gas. Actually, technically, it's not a incandescent gas. Technically, it's a plasma. But um, the, uh, the song from They Might Be Giants, they actually made a second song that corrected the scientific inaccuracies. So if you're interested in that, you can download it from, uh, from Spotify or wherever, I guess. But um, the sun is a nuclear reactor. 
you can't just look at a nuclear reactor without proper shielding. In fact, you can't be exposed to a nuclear reactor without proper shielding. And we feel that if you've ever had a sunburn, that's basically radiation burns from the sun. Even though the sun is 150 million kilometers away, it's so big and so powerful that that energy is still strong enough to burn our skin here on the earth, even though we have an atmosphere that blocks some of it. So your eyes are much more sensitive than your skin. If you stare at the sun for longer than like milliseconds, you can do permanent damage. The threshold is different for everybody. I know I, people always tell me, I stared at the sun. Um, yeah, you might have, and maybe you didn't do permanent damage, or maybe you did do permanent damage that you won't notice till you're 70 and suddenly have problems. Do not look at the sun. There's no reason to look at the sun. There's nothing to see with just your eyes, and it is just way too bright. We'll talk about how to observe it safely, but the sun has always been something that we wanted to know about. I mean, people have built monuments to it for thousands of years. People have, people have, uh, oh, I just had an internet thing pop up here. I hope I'm still streaming. Mike, hey, you still have me on there? Uh, yeah, you're still good on Zoom anyways. Hey, excellent. That's good to know. Okay. Um, so yeah, people have built these monuments to chart the paths of the sun, the, uh, the location of it in the sky. It helps determine our seasons. It determines uh, the weather here on earth. It's just, it's very, very important. Uh, and we've known that for thousands of years. Oh, uh, Rowan said she's been to Stonehenge and it was magical. Oh, I bet. Thanks, Melissa, for passing that on. It's, uh, it is, uh, go there one day I will get there, but, uh, haven't got there yet. Oh, that's nice. Okay. Um, well here in, uh, North America, various monuments have also been made to align with the, the rising and setting of the sun, everything from some of the, uh, the Mayan temples and pyramids. Uh, and cities to um, medicine wheels here in the prairies. There are a number of different ways that people have marked the rising and setting of the sun. Now, the sun is the biggest thing in our solar system. Frankly, it is our solar system. That's why it's called the solar system and not the earth system or the planet system or whatever. I mean, the sun is 99.8% of everything in the solar system. And if you look at the scale here, these, these images are all to scale. So little earth, is really, really um, small compared to the sun. And the sun, if we look at it in the proper wavelengths of light, so that we're not just overwhelmed, it's basically one big explosion going on constantly. So the sun is really important for us to understand because the sun's energy keeps us all alive here. If that energy output changes, well, that's the kind of thing we need to know. So there are a number of satellites that currently just do nothing but stare at the sun. They have proper solar filters in front of their cameras and so on. And they literally just watch the sun 24 seven so that we get a continuous picture of what the sun is doing. And when you look at the sun, you can see some of the things that are happening. There are these bright spots here. There are little sort of darker spots. There are these long filaments of of things here on the edge of the sun, you can actually see them in profile. They're like flames coming off the sun. These are called prominences. There's often dark spots on the sun that are visible as well. Uh, those are called sunspots. And there's another scale. There's good old earth compared to our, our images here. So looking at the sun, you need to protect your eyes. Some of the things you might think will protect your eyes won't. Literally, there are two things that will protect your eyes. One is a approved specialized solar filter designed specifically for looking at the sun. This will cost a hundred or two hundred dollars. So that is the thing. Um, if you've got a solar filter of some kind and you're not sure what uh, what's going on, uh, or you're not sure if it's safe or not, if you didn't pay a hundred bucks for it probably not safe. So that's option one. Option two, don't look at the sun. Those are literally the only two options. Sunglasses, not going to do it. Um, 
we used to have photographic film and people you would think that you could use photographic film or uh, CDs and DVDs, anything like that. It's not sufficient. Um, there are a whole bunch of things on the internet that will say, oh, take a Mylar balloon and look through that, that sort of foil balloon. No, 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 don't do any of that. Literally, you need a specialized solar filter. Or you need to look at the sun indirectly. We'll talk about that in a minute. A solar filter basically either goes over, over your eyes or it fits over the front of a telescope like this and makes sure that all of that light does not get into the telescope and make its way into your eye. So very, very important. When I do this demonstration outside, I, I point the telescope at the sun without the solar filter, not looking through it, but then at the eyepiece end here where you would put your eye, I stick a pencil and the concentrated light from the sun basically burns the pencil in half. It's like a laser. It is ridiculously powerful. And with a lens like this, where you're magnifying the energy, collecting more light, it's even more dangerous. Um, as an aside, I accidentally almost set the inside of my car on fire one day because I, I have a big telescope that I carry around and I had it in the back seat of my car and the lens cap had slipped off. And then I happened to be driving in the direction that the sun could go down the telescope tube through the window and then bounce off the mirrors and, and out the side. And it, it mel melted the frame of my door, all the rubber around my door, and it scored into the metal. It was a, a very graphic example of how much energy there is coming from the sun. Now there are specialized gear. There are special, this is a, a, a special telescope called a personal solar telescope that is designed specifically and only to look at the sun. You can't look at anything else with it. So if you want to look at the sun, you're kind of stuck um, getting very specialized gear, unfortunately. But if you do do that, you can actually get some pretty cool views. The sun is really, really interesting. It's the only star that we can see close up. And so therefore there is, um, a huge amount of detail to see. You can see uh, some of these brighter spots here on the edges. You can start to see some um, some of the sort of flames, I guess, for lack of a better term. Just right up above the logo there, there's a few of them. I'm just going to move us along here. There we go. You can start to see some of the flames on the left edge, just above the M from Manitoba Museum. And then in, in from there a little bit, you see sort of a bright spot with some dark spots around it. So these are images that I shot with a color video camera just a couple of weeks ago, just before the sun's activity started to increase actually. And uh, here, let's skip along. Here I've changed the exposure and you can really see the flames on the left a little bit better now. Actually, let me just uh, get rid of our logo for a second. There we go. Um, so those are those prominences coming off the sun. You can see that with this little solar telescope. Uh, which is pretty cool, to be honest. Uh, I was I was amazed at how much detail I could see on the sun using this specialized telescope. And then I did a, a little close-up video, which for some reason doesn't show up in a big size, but there are some of the flames there that were uh, that were coming off the the side of the sun with this uh, solar telescope. So I'm I'm actually kind of amazed that I can now do astronomy in the daytime. There's a lot of neat stuff going on in the daytime. Now I know most people don't have access to that. Um, so we will, we will try and do some streaming of this, but you can find ways to observe the sun safely without having to have expensive gear. If you do have any kind of optics like a telescope or like a um, pair of binoculars, even you can take your telescope and point it towards the sun and then looking down this way do not ever look through the telescope but just look at the shadow that it casts on the ground and as you move the telescope around that shadow sort of gets bigger and smaller when the telescope is pointed at the sun the shadow of your telescope will be a perfect circle because everything is basically lined up here and so you can then put a piece of paper back here not right up against it but back here and it will project an image of the sun onto the piece of paper. And you can actually see what the sun looks like without ever putting your eye in the, in the danger zone. You can actually do the same thing if you have a pair of magnifying glasses. If you've ever used, we're not supposed to do this 
obviously, but if you've ever used a magnifying glass to, um, you know, burn pieces of paper or things like that, if you put one like that and then hold another one underneath it, the two of them can focus together and make an image of the sun that you can take a look at as well. We've got some uh, other resources available on our uh, webpage that you can take a look at if you'd like to look at the sun. The easiest way though is to look at it online. Like I say, those satellites are looking at the sun 24 seven. And if you go to a website like spaceweather.com, you can actually see this kind of stuff, totally safe, no risk whatsoever. And you can see the activity on the sun. And when the activity on the sun increases, that's usually a good warning sign that we are going to have Northern lights coming up. In fact, tonight, if it stays clear, you might want to stick your nose out side because uh, there's a good chance of northern lights happening tonight due to some of the activity that's been going on in the sun over the last number of days or so. So the sun is only 150 million kilometers away. That's really, really close compared to the next nearest star, which is about uh, 36 billion, billion, billion kilometers away. And so it, it really is something that we can take a look at in detail and learn a lot about. But when we learn about the sun, we're kind of learning about all the other stars too, because those other stars, they're suns as well. Now, some are bigger, some are smaller. We talked about that last week with our bright star tour, how many of the stars are bigger than the sun or different temperatures or whatever. But there are... Um, there is a lot of information that we can learn about from our own sun and expand that to the rest of the universe. That's kind of how astronomy works. We don't know everything, but we can take a look at similar things and, and extrapolate and, and figure that they are a similar kind of object and so on. Let's move back here. Oops. Sorry, I see a whole bunch of questions going by. And so... Um, I want to get to a couple of the questions there. Uh, we are going to, we are doing our questions uh, towards the end, uh, but I just saw that Ryan is uh, asking, can we do a sun viewing workshop? That's a really good idea. Um, there is a solar eclipse coming on June the 10th. Now it's not a total solar eclipse. It's not the kind of thing like we had a few years ago where down in the United States, you got this amazing view of, it's what we call a partial solar eclipse and it is right at sunrise, so it's early in the morning, but it is gonna be visible from uh, Manitoba as a partial eclipse. And if you're in Ontario, uh, there are some spots where the moon will co almost completely block out the sun, except for a little ring of sun all the way around. It's called an annular eclipse or a ring eclipse. We'll talk a, a little bit more about uh, that event as we get forward, but I think I'll set something up so that we can do a sun viewing workshop where we just talk about how to view things. I'll, I'll bring out a little bit of gear and I'll gather together some, some resources. That's a, that's a great idea, Ryan. Thanks for that. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll get to some of these other questions that went by in our question um, and answer series, which is two segments away. But right now it's time for... Cool Space Stuff! <laughs> All right, back to Mars. We have the fifth flight of the Ingenuity helicopter, or Ginny, as, as she's uh, affectionately known. And this was a one-way trip. It didn't go up and then come back to the same spot. It went up and went off ahead of the rover and landed over there. And they're now, they're now going to use it, now they, that they know it works, they're now going to use the helicopter to basically scout ahead of the rover and look for interesting things uh, to send the rover towards, which is kind of what you want a helicopter for any, uh, you know, in this kind of mission anyway. You want to sort of get that above view where you can figure out where to go and see if there are any obstacles or things like that. So that's pretty cool. This is a picture of, uh, of Ginny during her fifth flight heading off to the new airfield, which is uh, about 500 feet away from, uh, from where she started. Uh, Percy has been, or Perseverance, the rover, has been busy this is the microscope camera. It's got a, a robot arm that basically can really zoom in. So here's a, an example of how much it zooms in from a rock to the point where here you can see individual grains of sand 
that are on the rock there. So this is the camera that will basically be looking at the details of the rock, trying to figure out what, the, what it's made out of, looking for signs of water. This is the camera that if there was any fossilized extinct life from Mars's ancient past, this is the camera that would find it. And they just got it uh, started up basically in the last couple of days. So it's just beginning its mission. This is just a focus test, this particular image, just to make sure that everything is, is working. So I'm really looking forward to seeing what it discovers. I would love it if they found fossilized something on Mars, but we'll have to see if that's uh, reasonable or not. And selfie time. Uh, NASA is big on taking selfies. The, the rovers all have these robot arms with cameras on them. And so if you basically hold the robot arm up like a selfie stick, and take a few pictures from different angles, you can Photoshop it all together to get the camera stick out of your way and get this wonderful selfie. So there's uh, Percy and is looking down over at uh, Ginny, the helicopter. This is back uh, before the first flight, but it's a, it's a nice picture. It takes a few days for them to get all the data back and, and assemble all the color images and stuff like that, but it's, it's nice to see uh, what's going there on Mars. And here's just a little close up. Now we're gonna to move to our Q&A session. Um, oh, sorry, I missed one thing. Um, we are coming into the time that the International Space Station is passing over Manitoba again. Again, you can, uh, you can find the link to times on the museum's website in the current night sky section under the planetarium. But basically, because of the circumstances, we can see the space station go over two or even three times a night after midnight and before dawn. So basically every 90 minutes or so, the space station will come over Manitoba and you'll be able to see it. It's different times every night, it changes. So you really have to take a look at the, at the link uh, from our webpage to know exactly when it's going over. But that is a really uh, interesting thing to see. That is a, a spaceship with seven humans on board. And uh, they're the only seven humans right now that are not on the planet Earth. Um, oh, somebody was talking, oh, a couple of questions on the Chinese rocket. Yeah, it did come down last week. The, uh, the Chinese space station is up there. We can't see it uh, this week from Manitoba, but its booster rocket did come down and it basically uh, landed in the ocean. So luckily it didn't fall on anybody, which is kind of nice. But uh, yeah, we were watching that fairly carefully. But as soon as I realized it was going to come down on the other side of the world from us and it was going to come down in the ocean, I sort of stopped, uh, stopped paying attention. I'd love to see something like that happen, you know, right over us so we could see this amazing reentry. But anyway, um, we had a question from Oakenwald School, uh, who I mentioned has sent in all of these letters. Uh, Lucy was asking, how many people have been in space? And the answer as of uh, just a few weeks ago, is 569. There are 569 people that have been into space. Many of them have, have been into space more than once, some of them as many as seven times. So there's been a lot more flights than that, but only 569 people out of, what, 7 billion people on Earth have been able to go into space so far. I hope that number gets bigger really soon. I would love to be able to go up there for a, a little tourist flight or something like that. But so far, only 569. So good question, Lucy. Thanks very much. And uh, let's see, we do have, uh, I, th I think, yeah, Mike, if you want to start um, gathering up a few questions, I'm going to start answering some of our Oakenwald questions. And then uh, when you've got a question ready, just jump in, okay? Right on. So, right. On. Right. Okay. So, Oakenwald School sent us a huge long list of questions and uh, we'll answer a few of them tonight that are sort of relevant there. Uh, Karen was asking, uh, did Mars ever have life? We don't know for sure and that's what Perseverance and, and uh, Ingenuity are trying to find out. It could have. The conditions were right for there to have been life on Mars, but we don't know if they were there or not. Um, Jamie was asking, um, when was Mars discovered and who discovered it? Well, Mars is a planet that is bright enough so that anybody that looks up at the sky could see it. So nobody really gets the credit for discovering it. The first people that ever looked at the sky probably saw Mars. And every country, every culture throughout history has had its own name for Mars, 
so it's sort of one of those things that has just always been there, like the sun. Nobody, nobody discovered the sun because everybody can see it right away. Um, let's see. Um, there was a question if Mars is the brightest planet, and it can be very bright. It can be the second brightest planet after Venus, if the conditions are right. But it can also be the faintest planet of all of the planets visible to just our eyes. So it's, it really changes a lot. That's a, that's a good question. Um, Jane was asking about the temperature on Mars. This one I had to go and check. I do remember a number of years ago, there was that meme going around how uh, Winnipeg was colder than Mars during the winter and stuff like that. So Mars actually gets up to plus 20 degrees Celsius. If you're at the equator on the hottest day of the year and you're standing on the surface, but the air is so thin that actually the temperature falls off very quickly as you get taller. Like, so if, if your feet are at plus 20 degrees Celsius, your head might only be plus 18 and up a little bit higher, it'd get pretty cold. The lowest recorded temperature minus 153 degrees on Mars. So not the kind of thing that you would really enjoy. That's, that is even colder than Winnipeg. Uh, let's see. And we had a few other questions that we will get to, I think next time around, uh, cause I wanted to, I see a number of these questions going through what, uh, what do you got there, Mike? Let's, uh, start off here. We got some questions from uh, early on in the broadcast. Uh, Lou on zoom was wondering how do astronomers measure light years? That's a good question. Measuring distance is tough because you can't just take out a tape measure and, and, put it at the other end. You have to sort of figure out the distance. There are a bunch of different ways. If something is close to us, like within the, the solar system, we can actually measure its position a few times and calculate its orbit and then figure out how far away it is from the sun, basically using uh, the mathematics. If it's farther than that, like some of the stars, we can still measure its position uh, and triangulate on it if it's close enough to us. As the Earth goes around the sun, we actually move a little bit. And so um, stars actually show a little bit of a shift. It's like if you hold your finger in front of your nose and then open one eye and close the other one and then switch them, your finger looks like it sort of moves back and forth. That's the way that's called uh, parallax. And that's the way we would calculate the distances to those stars. Beyond that, we're actually um, using the theory of what we know about stars to estimate distances. And ultimately, we're, uh, when we get to very distant things, we're using the, the, um, the redshift of galaxies and the expansion of the universe to calculate how far away things are. It seems kind of backwards using our theory to calculate distance rather than measuring the distance to, to figure out what our theories are. But that's kind of the way you have to do it. Everything is so far away that we just can't measure it very equally, very easily. Sorry. Great question. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Vivian is wondering, are there any stars that are not part of a galaxy, such as a star uh, between galaxies with no stars within hundreds of thousands of light years? Uh, do scientists even know that or is it even possible? Oh, it's it's definitely possible. Although I have to say, we can't see many of them because if they're that far away from a galaxy, that means they're that far away from us and they'd have to be really, really bright for us to be able to see them individually at that distance. But all the galaxies are generally in clusters and often big galaxies have little galaxies nearby and they're all gravitationally interacting. The gravity of, of the stars and of the galaxies do distort each other. And sometimes when two galaxies pass close to each other, you'll actually get stars that get sort of sent off into space or the galaxy will sort of rip apart and, and bits will fly off in all directions. So there's definitely stars out there between the galaxies. We just can't see individual stars at those distances because they're just too small. Uh, it's, it's hard enough just to see full galaxies, let alone one or two stars. Good question. Yeah, uh, they're great questions tonight. Uh, Landon is wondering if there is zero G in interplanetary space, how is there still enough G force to hold the planets to the sun? Ah, uh, yes, yes. So here's the thing. There is gravity in space. In fact, there is gravity everywhere. You cannot escape gravity. 
it feels like there's no gravity when you're in orbit around the earth, like in space, because you're basically um, in what we call free fall. You're in a spaceship and the spaceship and you and everybody in the, and all the equipment and everything are all sort of moving at the same speed. And so you don't feel the gravity, um, but it is actually there. If it, if it wasn't there, you could not orbit around the earth in your spaceship. You would just go flying off in a straight line. So it feels like there's no gravity because of the kind of orbits that our spacecraft use, but there really is gravity there. And so that gravity is still strong enough to keep all the planets in orbit, to keep the spacecraft in orbit. And uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's kind of a complicated uh, thing to think about, uh, or, and certainly to answer in a, in a quick question like this, but I hope that helps. Yeah, agreed. Uh, I'm not wanting to ignore our friends on social media. I just want to, uh, uh, just because we get so few comments from YouTube, I just wanted to relay uh, a comment from uh, Swimming Tigress Music, uh, who commented that they've actually been trying to live broadcast the summer solstice from Stonehenge, uh, but it's always been cloudy. And uh, I mean, it's England, so I mean, that's kind of almost... Uh, far for the course, but uh, I, I've always wanted to see that solstice uh, event from Stonehenge. So oh, uh, I absolutely. agree with that comment. Uh, yeah. And moving to Facebook, um, there was a question which I answered on Facebook, but I thought I'd share with everybody. Uh, someone asked, what is the largest star? Uh, and I've answered, I did a little research because I figured Scott, you, or do you know it off the top of your head? You know, I, I used to know the answer, but it has been... Um, they've discovered larger ones since then. It used to be um, uh, Eta Origae, but what, so what is the, the record holder now? Apparently it's a star called UY Scuti, which I just love that name. Um, nice. And it is apparently 5 billion times the volume of our own sun uh, located in the constellation of Scutum in the Southern hemisphere. And it is 10,000 light years away. So Wow. I just thought I'd share that with everybody because I did a little research on that. Uh, but Shauna on face Facebook is wondering, what is at the center of the Milky Way galaxy? Well, that's a great question. Um, the easy answer is we aren't 100% sure because it's, there's actually a lot of stuff between us and the center, dust and gas and other stars. But we've been able to um, see some of the stuff there. And there's a whole bunch of stars, lots and lots of stars. And they all seem to be orbiting around something that has a lot of gravity, but that we can't see. There's like this invisible material in the middle that everything is orbiting around. We believe it is a supermassive black hole. I say we believe, most scientists would say there's a supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, but that's still cutting edge enough that there might be other things that we just haven't considered or don't know about. But it's, it's, if it's not a supermassive black hole, we don't know what it is. So really, really dense, really, really heavy or um, object that has so much gravity that not even its own light that is shining can get away without getting sucked back in. And, this, and so all of these stars are orbiting around it, held there by gravity, and yet we can't see the thing itself. So that's what we've got there. I did want to mention, though, that uh, that UV Scooty was actually uh, my nickname in elementary school. I did not know that. Um, the moment I, is past. I, I it know, would have been funnier body, earlier, but that's OK. I don't even actually, know it, to that. it was Scotty. And uh, and we had seven Scots in my grade four class. And so everybody was always, um, you know, Scott plus your last name. So I was Scotty Y. And uh, Anyway, it, it sounded kind of like that. All right. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more question before we wrap for this time. Uh, yeah, again, sorry for all the questions we didn't get to, but we will uh, we will try again next week. And you can, um, if they're on the chat, I'll uh, go in there this evening and I'll try and answer some of the, uh, the other questions that are left. Yeah, uh, let's just uh, quickly go to uh, Dara's question on uh, Zoom. Uh, and if you don't know the answer, I quickly looked it up uh, so I can answer it. But when is the next mission to Mars and what will it be? Great question. Why don't you uh, tell us what you uh, looked up? <laughs> Very good. Uh, so it's a, uh, um, uh, a Russian European Union probe called ExoMars. Uh, it is oh, yeah. going to be uh, a lander with a rover on it. Um, I haven't quite looked up the exact details of what its mission is going to be. 
uh, but I am pretty sure it's going to be cool. That's all I know about it. But yeah, awesome. it's, yeah that, uh, it's coming from uh, the European uh, Union Space European Space Agency and the Russian Space Agency. That's right. That was actually supposed to launch at the same time as Perseverance and the other ones. We were going to have four Mars missions at once, and then it got delayed for budget cuts or something like that. And so that's coming up the next time. And uh, we'll we'll see who else throws their hat in the ring too, because I'm sure the next launch opportunity in 2022 there will be another fleet of spacecraft on the way there. Excellent. Well, thank you everybody for your questions. And again, you can uh, always send us your questions uh, between the shows and we can try and get to them. The uh, email, uh, YouTube comments and Facebook comments are all there. Uh, or you can drop us an email, um, space at manitobamuseum.ca if you're not on the various social medias. I will go to Facebook and YouTube after the show and I'll try and answer any of the questions that are in the comments there. So if you didn't get your comment answered um, or your question answered, uh, throw it in there and I'll, I'll try and get to some of those tonight as well. Remember, uh, Saturday night, we'll be doing telescopes. Hopefully it'll be clear. If not, I'll probably try that again the next night. Just keep in touch with us here at the Manitoba Museum. Uh, if you go to the website and you sign up for our newsletter, oh, Mike just put that into the uh, into the chat as well. It's uh, it's a great way to keep in touch, and whenever we have uh, events, we can we can do that. If you're on social media, uh, you can subscribe to the YouTube channel. You can um, turn on notifications in Facebook so that when we go live, you'll automatically get a a little message. Uh, it's not always us doing telescope stuff, but every once in a while, it's one of those beautiful nights we just decide hey let's go live right now and and there's not enough time to sort of let everybody know so stay in touch hopefully uh, you get a chance to get out under the clear skies in the next little while watch the moon look for mercury and venus and uh we will be talking next week about um the planet jupiter and we mentioned a solar eclipse coming up well there's also a lunar eclipse coming up that we'll have a chance to see part of from here in manitoba so we'll talk about the may lunar eclipse uh in next week's episode plus the usual you know cool space stuff and sky watch and and things like that thanks everybody for joining us i hope you have a wonderful evening have a great weekend we'll see you for international astronomy day on saturday and uh if you can't join us you can always watch it uh on, on repeat. So have a great evening and uh, 